I bow to Lord Krishna, the preceptor of the universe. I bow to the charioteer of Arjuna. Hari Om Tatsal. So this morning we are going to start the amazing book known as the Srimad Bhagavad Gita. And in India we start everything with a prayer. Whether we are taking a bath, or we are going on a journey, or whether we are doing some construction work or anything. We start with a prayer because we feel that unless we are connected to that divine force which is in everything, nothing will be a success. So now today we will start with a prayer to the book, the Bhagavad Gita herself. It is one of the Dhyana Slogas. So it, uh, first, we, there are many Dhyana Slogas. I will take one each day because otherwise we take too much of time. And so it is a prayer to the Book herself. Om Parthaya Pradibodidam Bhagavadam Narayane Naswayam Vyase Nagradidam Purana Munina Madhe Mahabharatam Advaita Mridavashinim Bhagavadim Ashtada Shadhyayini Ambatwa Manusandadami Bhagavad Gede Bhavadveshini. I bow to thee, O Divine Mother, Bhagavad Gita, who takes away the travels of, of the samsara. Um, Bhagavad Deshini. Oh, how, what are you? Uh, Parthaya Pradibhodidam. Where, did, where were you? Where was this um, knowledge given? To Partha or uh, Arjuna. Parthaya Pradibhodam Bhagavadam. Who gave the knowledge? And the knowledge was given by the Lord Himself. So it is a actually discourse between man and God, given by the divine chariot, the divinity Himself, to Arjuna, who is a prototype of the human being. Arthaya Pradipa Bhagavadam, Narayanena Swayam, He was the divine Himself. Narayanena Swayam, Vyasena Gridam. Now, who recorded this? Because it was being badly recorded, as you know, from here we've got the best recorder and uh, videographer around. So it was not recorded properly, then it's of no use to the world, uh, only to Arjuna. And this was not meant only for Arjuna, it was meant for the all future generations. So it was recorded by Vyasa himself, Purana Muninam. He was the ancient sage who has recorded all our Puranas for us. And therefore it was infallible, very carefully recorded. Madhyama, and where does it come? It comes Madhya Mahabharata. Mahabharata is one of the itihasas or epics of this country. The other being Ramayana and the Mahabharata. Mahabharata was written by Vyasa. And it comes in the middle, exactly middle portion of the Mahabharata. Why in ancient scriptures, things were kept, the place where things were kept, and the, the, the method it was said was also important. It, it, it was a pointer to what it was. And by keeping it in the middle, Vyasa wanted to show that it was the most important message of the entire huge uh, book known as the Mahabharata, Madhya Mahabharata. And what is the subject matter? Advaita Amrita Varshini. Advaita Amrita, what is its game? The sacred nectar of the, the of Advaita, of, of non-duality. It is giving us the sacred nectar of non-duality. Bhagavadi. Ashtada Shadi, she is, O Bhagavati, O Devi, you have 18 chapters. In these 18 chapters, is this uh, Advaita is um, Amrita Varshini. It's the nectar of Advaita is giving. Ambatvam Anusandadami Bhagavad Gita Bhavad Vaishini. I bow to thee, O um, Bhagavad Gita. So, this is the beginning of the first, one of the first Dhyana slogas of the Bhagavad Gita. Now, before actually going into the Bhagavad Gita, we have been told it is the um, it is kept in the middle of the Mahabharata. So there must be some relation between the story of the Mahabharata and the Bhagavad Gita. And that story actually has a very great uh, influence on, on how we understand the Gita. So even before going into that, let us go back because I would like you all, you may all know it, 
But still, I would like you all to know the history of the Sanadhana Dharma. Sanadhana, ancient Dharma. That his background history is very important for us. What is the basis or foundation of the Sanadhana Dharma? But people say Bhagavad Gita, say some say Ramayana. No, the basis and foundation is the Veda. The Veda is the basis of our. And what is this Veda? The Veda actually is a some set of sounds, actually sounds or mantras or sounds, which were captured by rishis in a high state of consciousness. They were they are always existing in the atmosphere, ac- ac- but we cannot hear them unless we are in a heightened level of consciousness. We cannot hear them. But these great rishis actually saw or heard. That is why they are known as Shruti. The Vedic Vedas are known as Shruti. That means that which is heard. So these are not unintelligible sounds heard by a set of stupid uh, old people over there in, 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 without any rhyme or reason. No. These sounds are so amazing. In fact, all the mantras are so amazing that they have the power to take us to the highest. Now, the highest power, in according to Sanat Dharma, is known as the Brahman. Brahman meaning that which is ever full, totally full. There's nothing beyond that. There's nothing that you can think of which is beyond that Brahman. So, these sounds are sounds which actually, in, in, the, in the original way, they just by listening to them. The Vedas are not written in some... Uh, or ancient Sanskrit in order to, uh, you know, while away the time or something. They are sounds, as I said, which have the power to take you straight to that Brahman from which they have come. This, that, that is why it's just listening. They, they're, not, they're not appealing to the intellect. They appeal to something far beyond the intellect. They draw out the very essence of the human being. And what is the essence of the human being? It is the essence of the entire cosmos, which is the Brahman. So these sounds originally were meant to take you to that Brahman. In that ocean of consciousness, which is known as uh, um, Brahman, Satchit and Ananda, which is known as Brahman, we are all points of consciousness in that ocean. And these sounds were such made in such a way that these little points were able to melt into that ocean of consciousness just by listening to them or just by reciting them. You can imagine the power of these Vedic sounds. Unfortunately, to the passage of time and the fact that the rishis were no longer here, the, these sounds were now only recited without any understanding and very often wrongly enunciated. So that they're useless, really. They're useless. So these sounds have lost. It's just being rotated and ro- in by, you know, memorized. And it is good that they're memorized and kept alive at least. But that uh, ability, we have lost that ability also. We have lost that ability to imbibe that sounds which will take us straight into that sea, which will allow our miserable little, small little consciousness to melt into that ocean or sea of consciousness. But with that, that came with the passage of time, it was lost. But it is still kept alive by these. They, they, the rishis made a, a, a group of people known as the Brahmins only in order to, to remember the Vedas. And remember, they were never written down because the, the spoken word, the, when it's written down, it's totally maybe different. If you try and read a Vedic mantra and you hear someone speak it, it means two different things, especially in other languages, it's gone. So they insisted it was an oral tradition, oral. From mouth to mouth, from heart to heart, it has been passed. So that the person who knows it, who writes, who writes he, t- sells it, he tells it to his students. So that is how the Vedas were passed. As I said, with the passage of time, they lost their efficacy because there were no people who were not capable, even the Brahmins were not capable of uh, keep, uh, reciting in the correct manner. And we ourselves are not capable of hearing and listening to it in the correct uh, way either. Therefore, luckily for us, there came a stage when the Puranic age came. Next was the, after the Vedic age came the Puranic age. And the great, greatest of the two great uh, Vedic um, Puranic sages were Vatmiji and uh, 
Veda Vyasa. And before the Puranas itself, Veda Vyasa actually took out from the best portion of the Purana, uh, the Vedas and made the final portion of the Vedas, which I know we all know as the Upanishads. So why did he do that? Because Upanish Vedas are not, we are not capable of understanding them or intellectually. Intellect has no part to play in it. But he made them into the Upanishads, which will appeal to the intellect. Those Vedic mantras were made into mantras of the Vedas, which are, which are not just sound mantras. The Vedic mantras are only sound mantras, which are capable of arousing great, uh, uh, um, amazing uh, uh, differences in our psyche. Here, these were the mantras which were capable of uh, understanding by the intellect. That's why he wrote, that's why Veda Vasa, he made into four of these things, he divided into four sections, and the Upanishads are the fruit of his um, uh, translation of the Vedas into intellectual, understandable by people who are not capable of that subtle method of, of, understand, of understanding. Because the Vedas had a very subtle method by which we, they could be understood. So that was lost in, during the passage of time and therefore he brought out the Upanishads and of course after that he brought out the great Puranas, I mean, the Mahabharata and the um, 18 Puranas. And again, these Puranas, they are also mantric in nature. When you read these Puranas, they, they all have like Anushtupa, like the Gayatri Mantra, of course, is the Vedic Mantra. But other mantras in, in, uh, in the Puranas, they also are capable of arousing certain uh, differences in our psyche. But they are also capable of being understood. The Vedic mantras have no meaning. They did not have any meaning. It's a sound which is important. Here the meaning came into play. And it was a kindness actually that they, due to Vyasa's great kindness, that he brought down the Vedas into the uh, form of mantras and stories also. Because he said, a story, you know, all, if you, even if you don't remember the thing, a story will always appeal to you. So all the great thoughts of the, of, of, uh, that Vedic structure of society was brought into the characters of the great, uh, which we, great characters which we see in the Mahabharata. Where, where can you see a, as noble a character as Yudhishthira? Where can you see a most cruel person like Ravana? Oh, so, so on. So these abstract ideas were brought into concrete personalities in the Puranas. So that was a great thing, he did, otherwise it would have been lost forever. So that, that was the next step in, in our you see. And uh, in, in, as I said, in that itself, in the Mahabharata itself, we find, as I said, that this is the Bhagavad Gita. The Bhagavad Gita is actually the essence of the Upanishads also. That's why its call is, at the call of on every day, Ahari Om Tatsat, it is Srimad Bhagavad Gita Upanishad Su. Not just one Upanishad, Upanishad Su, many Upanishads. Srimad Bhagavad Gita Upanishad Su. And so that, the, the essence of the Upanishads again was brought out into the form of the Bhagavad Gita, which is very important because we, uh, you see, the whole thing is a science, a science of being, this science of knowing who I am. Why have I come into this world? What am I here for? Is it all just cutting others' throat, getting some money and making uh, some, uh, owning cars and driving here and having the best phone in the world and so on and so Is that all I'm meant for? So that idea, that idea which, that, who are you, what, who am I, why have I, what is this world, why have I been projected here? We of the modern generation have totally so, the world and its technological, uh, you know, uh, instruments have totally overpowered our, uh, our original desire to know more about life. Because we, we want only something to do with uh, some instruments which keep us going, which keep us happy. We don't know, we don't want to know anymore how uh, life itself. This is, as I said, this is a great science. That science, in the colophon, you can, uh, people will say, uh, what is Bhagavad Gita? Some people say, oh, it is uh, this thing of, um, of karma, some will say it's of bhakti, or some of jnana. But the Lord himself has very clearly put it at the end of every, uh, every uh, chapter. 
ಇದು ಶ್ರೀಮದ್ ಭಗವದ್ಗೀತಾಸು ಉಪನಿಷ್ಠು ಬ್ರಹ್ಮ ವಿದ್ಯಾಂ ಫಸ್ಟ್ ದ ಹೋಲ್ ಕಾಲ್ ಫಾನ್ ಇಸ್ ಬ್ರಹ್ಮ ವಿದ್ಯಾಂ ಯೋಗಶಾಸ್ತ್ರೇ ಶ್ರೀಕೃಷ್ಣಾರ್ಜು ಸಂವಾದ ವಾಟ್ ಇಸ್ ಇಟ್ ಮೀನ್ ಬ್ರಹ್ಮ ವಿದ್ಯಾ ದಟ್ ಈಸ್ ಅ ನಾಲೆಜ್ ಆಫ್ ಬ್ರಹ್ಮ ದಟ್ ಈಸ್ ಅ ನಾಲೆಜ್ ಆಫ್ ದಟ್ ಸುಪ್ರೀಂ of which we are all parts as i told you we are all drops of consciousness floating around in the ocean of consciousness and all yoga is an attempt to unite with into that ocean of consciousness yoga comes as a word yuj to unite so all yoga is an attempt to unite the 18 chapters of the of the bhagavad gita have been called as different yogas arjuna vishada yoga sankhya yoga karma yoga bhakti yoga meaning they showing 18 different types of methods by which we can unite with the because any activity that can unite you with that um, brahman is considered a yoga so this the, uh, let us say go back to that let, let us see what he himself says what is the subject matter of this bhagavad gita brahma vidya that means first thing it is the, that teaches you the knowledge of brahman beyond which there is no knowledge that is the highest knowledge there is no other knowledge anything you can have a hundred uh, abc or something something mrcp and something in your so many uh, titles and, uh, and after your name it means nothing at all if you know nothing about brahman or what you are made out of you know nothing about yourself what can anything or knowledge of the world be of any use to you if you know nothing about yourself that is the state of the the, the world now we know nothing about ourselves we know everything about so many things that's happening in the world but we know nothing about ourselves so this is the first teaching here is brahma vidya the knowledge of that supreme of which we are all part we are only a part of that supreme so that means knowledge of the supreme will give you knowledge of oneself also first of all is brahma vidya then yoga shastra now a science pure science brahma vidya is pure science now pure science is not of any use to us knowledge of electricity as such is of no use until it was found a method of found by which we could get that electric light bulb shining around here by which we could heat our water by which so many things are being done isn't it so no pure science by itself is no use and is applied science then another set of scientists who who will do applied science so the second part of that call of honors brahma vidyayam yoga shastra yoga shastra what is it the application of that knowledge of the of the brahman into the practical daily life which you are. how do i get electricity how what sort of bulb should i get how should i this thing how should i switch all this practical application is absolutely necessary because even though you know all about everything there are so many great souls ever who knew everything but unless we know how to practice into our daily life what use is it for us isn't it it exists no doubt it exists electricity exists everywhere but what use is it if it if it can not be made a part of our daily life therefore it is not only brahma vidya but yoga shastra it is the practical application of that brahma vidya into the daily aspect of every human being every human being mind you i mean it is not limited to the sanatan dharma it's not limited to there's this amazing country called bharat no doubt it was given to us here and we have not used it in the correct properly others are taking it away from us but the fact is that even though it is given to us here our our actually duty is to spread this to make it make even the hindus themselves in this country to become aware of the great wealth or treasure which is there in this in this very sand of this country that we have lost we don't we think the westerners are much better more superior much superior they have they have drained us of our all our wealth india was the greatest country the richest country in the world before the british came over uh, gdp or whatever you call it was some um, 74 it came down to 7 degrees when the british left you know that all the great 3 uh, degrees okay 3 all the all the great uh, things that we have um, were, were taken away by us. so many famines they created the famines they drained us both emotionally uh spiritually politically and uh, e- economically and we are still in that state because we still we think they are the greatest that we are not the greatest 
So it's high time that all of you, you are the, uh, you are the messengers of this great uh, knowledge, spread it to all the world. Make more children of which, you, which will generate this knowledge because this is what we want is to be generated more, uh, another generation which will have full faith in the values of this country and be able to pro pro produce uh, a country or a culture which will once again become the greatest in the world. Understand? So let's, so what is it? First of all, application, you know, first of all, um, the knowledge, pure science, applied science, and finally, what is the first? Sri Krishna Arjuna Samvada. What should applied science lead to? Okay, I know how to put on a, uh, get the light into a bulb. But I don't know how to put on the switch. Only then I'll get the unity with that. So, it is, it leads to Krishna Arjuna Samvada. It is the bondage or the union between the divine and the human. It must lead us to that. That is the highest knowledge, the highest union, the highest that we can ever aspire to, the human being can ever aspire to. That is, we have to become one with that from which we have come. That is the goal of Hinduism. That is the goal of the Sanatana Dharma, Moksha. That is, and it does not mean that you may totally disappear. That we'll discuss later. But it means that you are in touch with that divine all the time. <coughs> you understand? So these are the... He himself, has, Vyasa himself, has very clearly said, what is the message of the Bhagavad Gita? Hmm? That is, it is the Brahma Vidya, Yoga Shastra, Sri Krishna Samvade, pure science, applied science, and what benefits you get from that. Understand? So it's beautifully, this is, this is the science of life. This gives you the science of life, the science of being. Which is not only the science of being, the, the, uh, the art of living also it gives. No, science of being as well as the art of living in gift. Understand? So that is the greatness of the Bhagavad Gita. Now, let's go back. As I said, we have to know a little bit about the history of the background of the Gita before we can really appreciate. Because another thing which you will start reading the Bhagavad Gita, you will, the two questions which normally will come to anybody is this thing. Why was this set in a battlefield? A discourse like this, an amazing... Spiritual discourse. Why is it in a battlefield? Why couldn't Krishna have told Arjuna? Arjuna and Krishna were with each other, but were friends and um, cousins. He could have told Krishna any time. Come on, my dear chap, I've got some things to tell you. You can go to a temple or a, some um, river bank or ocean uh, beach and told him all this. No, he waited for this particular moment, a disastrous moment, a, a battlefield of all things, the last place you will think of giving a spiritual discourse. Why did he give that? One question which will always come. Second question, why did Lord Krishna ask Arjuna to fight? This is a very moot point. Why? The Sanadana Dharma is based on Ahimsa. So why did he tell him to fight? These two questions can be understood only if we know the background of the Mahabharata which is a, in which this book has been placed. So, in ancient times, uh, the, there was a great um, uh, Kuru dynasty which ruled from Hastinapura. So, they, Bhishma was the, the um, progenitor, um, grandsire, and he had his, he, he had given up, he, he gave his, uh, the throne was uh, given over to the Rashtra and Pandu, the two, two uh, grandsons actually. And um, the Rashtra was born blind. And so Pandu, the kingdom automatically went to Pandu, the younger brother. And for, for the, the, the Rashtra, had, for some reason, Pandu went to the forest for some this thing. And uh, at that time, uh, he, he got, the children, they got at, during that time when Pandu was in the forest. Uh, the Rashtra is supposed to, uh, he was ma married to Gandhari. Gandha, Gandhara is a modern Afghanistan. She was the princess of Aga Afghanistan. So at that time, Afghanistan was part of India. We have a lot of places all part of India which are mentioned in the Mahabharata which have been given away by certain people or taken away or usurped by others. So then this, uh, actually Hinduism was, uh, whole of Southeast Asia was Hindu at one time. And we conquered without even one drop of blood being shed. We conquered only through the, the amazing quality of our culture. That also should be understood, okay? Now anyway, that is the digression. Now, he, now we come to that, the Mahabharata is, uh, uh, the, these two other opposing clans were the Pandavas on one side and Kauravas. Because the Pandus 
um, white was called Kunti, and they went to the forest and he, uh, there they got um, five children. He had two wives, Kunti and Madhuri, and the, these are the five Pandavas, Yudhishthira the eldest, Bhima the second, third was uh, Arjuna, and the twins um, belonging to Madhuri were Nakula and Sahadeva. In the meantime, these people had, um, Pandu died. Pandu died in the forest, and the children were brought up by Kunti. When Rajisra reached the age of 12, the Bhishma sent word to them that this is not correct, because actually he is the son of the uh, king, Pandu, so he, they have to come back. So Kunti brought the children back. Now the Kauravas, the, the eldest of the Kauravas were known as the Jyodhana. And the Jyodhana, and, and the Kauravas were, they were the opposite of the Pandavas. In that you see these contrasts also shown because they are all Pandavas and Pandavas are all within us. We are also very good sometimes, very bad sometimes. So they went back and um, Yudhishthira was proclaimed king, uh, um, heir apparent rather, um, you know, heir apparent. So uh, Yuvraj and Duryodhana was mad. So he tried many methods. He was being advised by his uncle called um, Shakuni, who was uh, Gandhari's brother, who had come with her to help her because her husband was blind. And she was also blinded herself. So it's one blind leading the blind in, in, in that we will see. <laughs> so then uh, he gave her very bad advice. He told him all the time what he should do. Now they tried many ways. They tried to kill them by giving poison. They tried to put them in a house of lack in Varanasi, told them to go and stay there and they set fire to that and so on. So many things were done. But in last one was that Varanasi one. At that time, now Pandavas had this very beautiful uncle also there the um, uh, maternal uncle, I think, yeah, uh, called Vidura. Vidura who was known for his wisdom. So he knew of the plot to kill the Pandavas and he had already made a tunnel from the, uh, the palace in the, uh, in the woods so that these Pandavas escaped. When the, the, this thing was set fire, they escaped through that. At that time is when um, Krishna came into their lives. Krishna is, oh, was their, both their cousin. Kunti's uh, brothers, actually, one of his brother's uh, sons. He was their cousin as well as a very good friend. Always somehow he supported them because he realized that at the time, you know, the, the Bharat was under very great, lot of uh, Mahasampadas who were fighting with each other. Each one had a state of its own and were trying to con get, gain control. And he realized if he wanted to make a dharmic Bharat, he must have rulers who are dharmic. Therefore, he knew the Pandavas were highly dharmic and therefore he decided to support them. That's why he supported them. So then he tell, told them to go and attend the Swayamvara of the princess of Panchala, Draupadi, the princess of Panchala, who was a very, very, very great kingdom at that time. He knew that if he, they could get the support of the Panchala kingdom, then only they could go and ask for their own kingdom back. So then they went, Arjuna, and there was a big... Uh, this thing, uh, you know, shooting uh, 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 kind of a test where everyone had to shoot a whirling uh, fish with uh, three arrows which were given to them. Now, Arjuna was the... Arjuna, Arjuna and Pandavas did not go as they were because if they then they would have been noticed and the Duryodhanas would have jumped on them. So they went just as Bra Brahmins. So after all the other the other um, uh, the Kshatriyas took, uh, tried their best to get, uh, get Draupadi. They all failed, including Duryodhana, all of them tried. And the other was Krishna told them, do not, because all the uh, great kingdoms had been called, invited for Draupadi uh, Swamara. Now, Krishna told none of the other was could uh, take part in it, because he knew he himself or one of his things, they could easily have done that. Now, the only other person left who could do it was Arjuna. So Arjuna, after the Kshatriya said they, they couldn't do, uh, this Dibna, that is Dabati's brother, asked the, oh, threw it open. Any Brahmin or anyone else who wanted, they could uh, take it. At that time, Arjuna went forward and because the Kshatriya could not bear it that a Brahmin could have done such a thing. So they all pounced on Arjuna. In the meantime, what, um, uh, what uh, Bhima stood as a, as a kind of a, uh, you know, Protecting him, Raman told Arjuna, take Zapati and go. Zapati was very happy to go. She had already fallen for Arjuna, so she, he caught hold of her and they left the place immediately. And then later on, of course, they came to know that she was none other than he. They were all actually the Pandavas. And Dhrupada was very happy to hear that. 
and he agreed to help them and they, he sent her this thing and went back to Hasanapura and they demanded their, uh, uh, their share back, which was their kingdom. Duryodhana said, no way I'm going to give you. And eventually after a lot of debate and this, this thing and so on and so forth, he agreed to give them half the, half the portion. And he gave them a very a portion infested by wild animals, full of forests, which on, um, you know, Hasidah was here, to, to the um, south of uh, Hasidapura. So that, Krishna said, don't worry, just accept all they get. So he accepted, the, and Krishna called, saw to that the great um, architects, they made a wonderful city for them called Indraprastha, on which modern Delhi rests today. So, in, in fact, the, the, uh, the ruins of Indraprastha are still to be seen. If you go to old Delhi, you can see the uh, ruins of Indraprastha. So then, there they had a wonderful listing, and they you know, once uh, Yudhishthira decided to give a yaga, uh, a Rajasuya yaga, which will proclaim him as the emperor of everyone. In the and, and uh, so that during that he invited everybody, everybody came, including his uh, cousins, everyone. And now the fact is that they, uh, this Mayan who was the architect of the, they had made a beautiful palace of illusions for them. For him. So Duryodhana was a very pompous, he was not only, you know, he was a very brutal type, but he was pompous also. Now he went in and it, once when he saw, he thought there was some water, a pool with lotuses, he tried to go on the other side. And he then he just suddenly realized it's not a real lake, it is a made-up lake. And he thought he heard Draupadi's laughter somewhere. He was even more angry because Draupadi had seen this uh, faux pas he was making. Then next he came to another lake and he said, oh, I know all about these lakes and he went in and boom, he fell because there was water in there. And he was totally uh, drenched. And again he thought he heard Draupadi's laughter. But, and he was mad. And poor Yudhishthira tried to do everything. I told him he'll give him anything he wanted, whatever he wanted. Please say, I'm so sorry and so on and so forth. He said, no, I shall see, I shall take revenge on all of you. And see, they saw that one day he will make Draupati um, make a laughing stock of her in such a sabha like this. And he went off and with his uh, help of his uh, Shakuni said, he said, come on, let's all go back and fight with her. Shakuni said, no, this is not the time for you to fight with them because they are in the height of their power. All the, everybody has uh, in, in their list. That is not the time for you. But I will do something by which you can get the entire uh, the, uh, the land without a, a single drop of blood being. He said, you, uh, we will arrange a, a match, a um, dice match. In those days, it was good for uh, kings could uh, take part. It was a royal game, Chaturanga. So he invited uh, Yudhishthira and he sent Vidura with the invitation. He was very clever. He knew that we sent any one of his own people, they will have accept. But Vidura, they loved Vidura, his beloved uncle. So he, they, he sent Vidura with the invitation. And Vidura went and told Yudhishthira, don't accept it. Don't accept it because it, it is some trick of his. But Yudhishthira said, you, this is an invitation sent by my uncle who is my, like my father, the Rashtra. And you are my, another uncle which is so dear to my heart. How can I, it would be an insult to both of you if I don't accept. So very foolishly actually he accepted it. And they all went in five beautiful jewel chariots each one of the brothers, and Draupati also went with them. She was the empress, the empress of India she was, as, as Yudhishthira was the emperor. So they came into looking at this glorious thing coming into the Hastinapura, and the Jodhana's eyes were green with envy. He was, wanted somehow to see that he'd get everything back. So they started the match, and at the start of the match, the Yudhishthira um, said, uh, look, um, uh, uh, instead of me, my uncle um, uh, Shakuni will pay for me. So he immediately said, what, how can you have someone and playing for you? He said, no, no, I will put the, the, uh, the stakes, I will put, <coughs> but uh, he will throw the dice. Now, Yudhishthira even at that time didn't say anything. And the fact was that Yudhishthira was actually a very good player, but Shakuni was not only a master player, he was a master cheat. <laughs> so that... Every time the dice was um, this thing, they were, the Kauravas roared with joy because every time the Pandavas lost. First of all, first thing that Duryodhana wanted was the chariots. Chariots were lost. 
then his uh, palace was lost and so on. So he lost everything. At the end of it, he lost everything. But um, then he said, uh, so um, he said, I have nothing more to lose. Because they said, come on, uh, we will throw the dice again. So then they, uh, Duryodhana said, you have your brothers? You can, you can, uh, you can badger your, your brothers? So one after one, his beloved brothers, he badgered and lost. Eventually, then, then again, he said, that's it, he was just sitting there. Then again, the Jordan said, come on, come on, you can, one last one. He said, what do I have to lose? He said, you have your wife, the Apati, get her in here. So everybody was shocked into silence, you know. Apati had not come to the, so with great, and he said, look, to make him, instigate him further, he said, if you win, everything else I will give back to you at one throw. If you lose, then of course I get the Apati. So then he sent his um, his uh, uh, brother, what's his name? Um, Dushasana. He sent Dushasana to get Draupadi. So <laughs> Draupadi was a woman of very high fiber in all ways. She was brought up as a, as a man. She knew all the military these things and everything. So she said, who asked you to do? Who got you? I'm not going to come, come with any of you. Who, uh, who is it? And then he said, he said, don't, you can ask all your questions into this thing. Your husband is the one who um, lost you. So she said, did my husband raja me before or after he lost himself? Because if it's after he lost himself, he's already a slave. And a slave cannot play with a king. So then that is null and void. I, it cannot be accepted. But if he, if he lost me before, then it's a different matter. If it's after, it's a different matter. So he, the shah said, look. You go and ask these questions from there. I don't. I know nothing about all these. Come on! And when she refused, she supposed to have dragged her by her hair and through the streets of Kastinapura put her to the sabha, where he threw her to in front of the huge, uh, of uh, you know, assembly of elders and so on. You can imagine that. Duryodhana said, then uh, that told the told all of them, you are now my slaves. Take off your uh, crowns and your uttariyams, which they are very important. So they all took out the crowns and the Then he said, let this woman also be disrobed. She's my slave now. So he did, let her be disrobed. Everybody was shocked. And he told Dushasana, Dusha, Dusha, pounced on her like a tiger and started to take out her robes, you know. And Draupadi looked at everyone, looked at her five husbands, not one, but two, but five husbands she had. And all of them of the greatest men, of the greatest warriors of that land. Not one of them would even look at her. They all sat like this. <coughs> they couldn't say a word. Then she looked at the elders, Bhishma, Drona, and all the Kripa, uh, all these great um, um, people who were standing, uh, uh, was part of that assembly. And she asked, her, Is there no, who, did my husband lost me before or after he lost himself? Have you all, known, are you going to watch this adharma hap happening in this court? Not a soul said a word. Then she was holding her, this thing like this. She was holding, trying to, you know, protect herself. Then she realized that, actually speaking, there was no human soul who could save her. Nobody, however great her husbands were, nobody who could save her. The only one who could save her was the Lord himself. And she, she stopped protecting her. She left her this thing and raised her hands up and said, Ha ah, Krishna, Dwaraka Vasan. Kwasi Yadavanandana, Imam Avastam, Sampatam, Anadam, Kim Karishesi, he said, Oh Krishna, you are staying in Dwaraka, Dwaraka Vasan. I have come to this terrible state. Anadha, I am an orphan, I have not, no one to help me. How have you disowned me into this state? she says. And it is said that the Shasana kept pulling and pulling and pulling and pulling until the cloth rose higher and higher and higher. Jaupati was in a state of ecstasy at them. She said, Ha Krishna, He Krishna, Ma Yadava, Dwaraka Vasin, Yadava, Madhava, and so on. She would keep on repeating. She did not, she could not know, even know what was happening. But Dushasana, this huge, hefty King Kong like wrestler over there, he fell to the ground because he could no longer fall. Immediately, that was a miracle which brought the whole assembly to a state of absolute stunned they were. And uh, the Rashtra said, stop it, stop it, I, we cannot have this anymore. He said, no, you have to give back the kingdom, enough of this. So Jyotana said, what nonsense is this? How, he said, how, how can I give back something which I've gained by correct, uh, my correct things? I, I, I won this by, by this uh, um, 
die is plain so he refused eventually they somehow or other they made a big uh, pact and they decided that the pandavas were going to be uh, uh, banished to the forest for 13 years that is 12 years in the forest and 13th year they had to spend incognito in some town where if the yodhana spies could find them out they have to repeat again another 13 year so the yodhana is full full proof uh, scheme because i'll try and find them while in the forest it's there and definitely if not i will i will kill them by then forest if they know if not i will discover them in there so the the amazing uh, this thing seen in the mahabharata when they leave the way how they came and how they left they came in these five golden chariots and as they are going they were no absolute just one utariyam down and they were kicking the dust to just said because it uh, it's like bima every th- he was kicking at f- thousands of uh, warriors of the each of them cursing each of each of these people curses that and they and the rashtra trembled with fear fear when he heard all these because but do you then i couldn't care less and so they left in it so this shows how uh, we we may think we have so much money we can do anything but it is easy next moment we can become pauperized we may all your stocks may this thing you may be condemned with cancer you may have nothing is really of any importance except the fact that you are a divine spirit is in that that is the most important thing that one has to find and cling on to not to to the earthly values of earthly life is one similarly the draupadi story is something which is a which is a, a direct uh, a, a kind of a advice to all women at least even all women that we we are never alone don't ever think i'm a woman and i'm i'm alone if you are what whatever you are you are the whether you're a man or a woman actually what is the difference there's actually no, no difference actually they may have a little bit more strength that is all but what are we we are really helpless against the so many things of nature so many things we are all helpless the only person who can help us who can turn to which can we can rely on at any time at any place in any condition is only the lord himself that is a great, great one of the greatest passages of the mahabharata when she gives up all hope of every anyone and gives up all hope of her own ability to save herself that also because she thought she also thought that oh i'm great i can save myself but he, she realizes that no power on earth could save her only power on earth which could save her was a divine power so that again is an amazing lesson to all of us that we in any condition that we are the only power that can save us and help us is un, which gives unconditional love at all times is only the power of god so these are the two so now this is the <clears throat> background somehow the um, um, pandavas managed to f- spend the 12 years of their this thing then they spent the 13th year in the kind of thing of virata one of the great uh, kings of india at that time and they were uncon- incognito and at the end of the year they 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 came out of the this thing and they went to uh, they virata was so happy with them that he actually gave them a, another town in which from which they could negotiate with the kauravas so they sent a messenger of the messenger to the kauravas to say you this guy wanted peace whatever happened he didn't want he didn't want to fight a war war was threatening because they've been pushed into war remember that why did the question is why did krishna encourage arjuna to fight they were being pushed into it now he sent messenger but dujwana said tell that you know was stupid useless uh, coward yudhishthira that he, if he wants his kingdom he has to fight for it i'm not going to give it to him eventually they sent uh, yudhishthira asked krishna himself to go as ambassador to the court of the kurus that's again a wonderful scene in the mahabharata when krishna himself walks into the court of the, and the yodhana he had prepared a big palace and so on so forth for him because he knew he has to somehow you know butter up krishna and make him into their side so duryo uh, uh, um, krishna instead of going into duryodhana's palace he went to the hut vidura's hut because vidura at the time of draupadi uh, uh, you know that when she was being vastrabharanam uh, vidura said i cannot sit stay in this palace with uh, you know eating the, the food of these people who are such adharmis 
that will affect me also. He is the only one who has the courage to walk out of the palace, and he lived in a little hut at the, in the corner of the village. So Krishna said, "I am going to." He instead of going to the palace of Duryodhana, he goes to the little hut of Vidura, where Vidura Patni is supposed to have served him. With, they had nothing much, but they, it was given with such love. Betua leaves. She has fed him supposedly with betua leaves, which uh, were relished by him. So then the next day, so the Duryodhana decided. This is no no use. I cannot get Krishna onto my side. I will kill him. So he prepared a trap for him. So it's a kind of a chair which, when he sat, it will be pulled down and he would get killed. So he, Krishna was warned. Everybody told him. Krishna's friends were with him. They told him, "Don't go." He said, "Don't worry. We'll go. Come on." So he, he went. He strode into the city. And the Duryodhana had asked everybody, "Don't stand up when that cowherd comes in." And it is said, everybody stood up, and Duryodhana was somehow thrown out of his. Uh, thrown <laughs> his chair, and he also fell flat. <laughs> so then he went and he told, they told him to uh, sit on the this thing. And before that, I'm sorry, he he gives a uh, no. After that only, uh, he sits in the chair, and the chair falls down. And the the was was so happy. But then suddenly you find that he comes out of that thing, and he shows the Vishwarupa Darshana there. That's one of the times he uses shows a. We should do that. Now we all the rishis and all this thing, but unfortunately, of course, only the dharmic people could see him. Duryodhana and all could not see. Him. Then he said, and then he gave he he gave his famous speech as a banditer. He said he gives to tell Duryodhana, you are going to be the cause of the 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 destruction of your your country and your your race. So please change all this thing. The you the. Uh, Pandavas are ever ready to be with you and to help you in everything. Rule together, do everything. So you'll be so you'll be the greatest uh, kingdom on on earth. So Yudhishthira said, "No, no." So then, uh, no, sorry, Duryodhana said, "No, no." And Yudhishthira had already told Krishna, "Look, I know that um, Duryodhana may not, but ask him first of all. Ask him for half the country, which is which is our ours by right. If he refuses that, ask him to give us five towns." Otherwise, five villages. Otherwise, five palaces. We have, we'll settle for anything because he did not want war. Remember, the war they did not force a war. They were not anxious for war. So um, Krishna says this. Then Duryodhana's uh, classic answer was, "Look, uh, he says, go and tell that coward that I will not give him even five pinpoints of land, not even five pinpoints of land. I am against all giving. I don't like giving at all." I never like to give. So go and tell him that. And if he wants his land, he can fight for it like a chhatriya. So then again, Krishna tried to many ways to try to. He refused to, and he declared immediately. He declared war, and he started to amass uh, uh, many, many different types of. Or you see, because the both the uh, opponents were related, so those everybody who approached them, they were also related. So what the kings decided? Whoever approaches me first, we will agree. So Duryodhana very cleverly started amassing a big army even before the Pandavas even agreed to the war. So then uh, at that time, uh, it is said, of course, um, the Pandava, the Yadava army was a very great army at that time. Yadavas were very very great uh, warriors at that time. Krishna had made you know, the Dwaraka was the capital of his uh, country, and they were great warriors. So both um, Pandavas and uh, um, yeah, Kauravas, Duryodhana decided, I must somehow try and get uh, go there and get Krishna on my side. Otherwise, we will never, we will never, you know, win. So it happened that both Arjuna and uh, the, um, Duryodhana went to the um, to to Dwaraka at the same time. And Krishna is supposed said, said to be have been sleeping. He was sleeping like down in bed. Now there was a chair kept at the uh, at the feet. So Duryodhana came first, and he looked at the chair, and he quickly took the chair and put it on the head, because he's a great um, um, king. How can he sleep at the sit at the foot of this cowherd? So he put it there. Arjuna came next, and he just stood before the um, at the foot. When a man opens his eyes, well, who will he see at the foot or the back? Or on the back of it, he saw Arjuna first. Krishna. So he said, ah, "Arjuna, what can I do for you?" Duryodhana made it. I'm also here. I also want the same thing. So how would have I come to you? I want your army. So Arjuna also, you know, said, "See, I've come for the same thing." So then he said, "Well, I, I, you know, 
I've seen, um, uh, you know, uh, I'm related to both of you. And therefore, I'll do one thing. I saw Arjuna first, so I will <laughs> ask him one. He said, no, 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 no. <coughs> Do you understand? I came first. So he said, well, well, well. Okay, then I'll do one thing. I will divide. I will give my crack regiment, known as the Narayana Sena, in which many of his own sons were in that Sena. <coughs> I will give that to one side, and I myself will go to one side. Duryodhana said, that's very unfair. So what do you mean that's very unfair? He said, if you go to one side and you're fighting, you will definitely, you'll be able to annihilate the entire army. So you, you must promise you won't fight. You cannot take up weapons. So Krishna said, I cannot take up weapons. And I can, <laughs> the army is going to one side. And I, without weapons, to one side. You think that's very, very fair? Duryodhana said, yes, very fair. <laughs> so he said, okay then. But even then, I will give first choice to Arjuna because I saw him first and he's the younger of the two. So Duryodhana didn't know what to say. He said, anyway, these Pandavas are so stupid. I'm sure he'll choose the wrong thing. So, so Krishna asked Arjuna, Arjuna, do you want uh, me unarmed, unresisting, not fighting? Or do you want my crack regiment, the Narayana Sena? Arjuna said, I want you alone, my lord, he said. Then, uh, and the Duryodhana was overjoyed. He was so happy to get the, what he wanted was the army. So it is said that he gets the army and uh, then Krishna tells uh, Arjuna, uh, after Duryodhana leaves, he says, why did you make such a stupid choice, Arjuna? Why did you say all, was that you wanted me when I, I'm, I'm not even fighting? He said, he said my lord, he, I, I know that if you are with me. I don't need anything. I don't need anything. You, if you, I, you alone are all that I need. So he said, Krishna said, well, okay, even though you're so foolish, I'll do something. I must do something for you. Therefore, I shall become your charioteer. That is how he becomes Partha Sarathi. Partha is another name for Arjuna. Sarathi is the name of charioteer. So he becomes Partha Sarathi. Partha Sarathi was the name. And he is the one who he... he um, uh, was it his charioteer in the whole of the battle? So, uh, so that and, and then at that time they were all. So this is one of the reasons I, I was telling you. One of the reasons why Krishna asks him to fight because it is totally against uh, the the nature or the function of a kshatriya. What is the function of a kshatriya in a society? To say fight for dharma. And uh, being a Kshatriya, he, Arjuna has every right. This is duty, moral obligation to fight for dharma so that the land would not be once again be in the hands of adharmis like the Kauravas. So that one's duty, Swadharma, has to be done at all costs is one of the teachings of the Bhagavad Gita. Because it's a practical, as a practical application. How do we get on in this world? How can we, how can we move forward without, uh, you know... Uh, Getting into embroiled in this uh, Maya of the of this world of the external world by following one Swadharma is one of the the <coughs> basic lessons he gives Arjuna. So therefore, he as a Kshatriya, you have every duty to fight. He will tell him that now in the in the second chapter he is going to say that. But your moral duty to fight with the with this thing. So um, that is one of the reasons which he. Um, also, that, uh, that uh, as I said, nowadays people say, why Hindus are still so this thing, why, why they, oh, we are told never to fight. It's not true. All through our history, we have fought for our land, for our country, for our dharma. Oh, you read the hist correct history of India, you will realize that. We have never, we have never uh, gone and, uh, and you know, uh, 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 Akraman, we have not um, uh, invaded another country. We have not forced our might on another country. Definitely, we're the only country which has never invaded and fought against another country in order to get. But we have always fought for our rights, for our dharma. If we don't protect our dharma, who will protect it? It is being taken away. It has already been taken away by others. It's a high time that the young Hindus of this generation ro rose up to the fact that our, our, our dharma, our country, everything is being taken away from us. And we start to fight back. You don't have to fight with swords, but you have to see the mouth itself, the tongue itself with the greatest sword. You can spread, spread this information, spread this knowledge to as many people as you can and tell them to take up. Never give in, never give in to, to just because people say, oh, all Hindus are so sweet, they will always adjust. They will. No, it is time we do not become adjust like that. It's time we fought for our dharma. Understand? This is the time. We are at the crucial state. Uh, 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 where the, uh, 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 
war exactly like the Kurukshetra war is already there internally, externally, everywhere it is going on. It's high time we decided to be Arjuna's in this battlefield, uh, which will actually will totally demolish our entire dharma if we do not. Uh, we, are, we are not ready to accept the fact that we are the warriors of, uh, we are suppose and as I said um, though we are being told the fact that you, you, we never fought it's not true we have, all through the history we have had people fighting for our dharma though it has been uh, some, somehow um, the, the idea of not, ahimsa and so on has been brought out by Gandhiji which has taken over the entire nation but it's not true who practices the Christian Christian this thing of, of ahimsa have they ever practiced it not ever. The great biggest wars in, in, in the history of the, of the world has been fought by the Christian uh, countries. Just think of it. They enforce it on us and they do not practice that themselves. So don't get, get uh, involved in that sort of uh, this thing. Just realize that we have every duty to fight for our dharma, fight for our country, fight for this culture which has lasted for thousands and thousands of years. And which is almost in the, in, almost going to perish under our very eyes. It is our duty to fight for it. Okay, so this is the great so background of the the the, uh, the Mahabharata war is the background of this uh, book, the Bhagavad Gita, and it's very important, as I said, that we know about it because uh, that understanding is something which will make us. Uh, Realize why he asked um, Arjuna to fight. Secondly, why the battlefield? And the question is, why the battlefield? Now, battlefield is actually an allegory for all life. We are constantly fighting bat battles on many different sections. Even in the beginning of creation itself, the whole of creation was through a huge conflict of Big Bang or whatever there was. There was a huge conflict going on. There were, uh, out of all the chaos and so on and so forth, the, some sort of a cosmos came out slowly, slowly, slowly. Uh, even according to science, physics, that, that is the ne Next, what about us? On, we are battling on many fields. First field is the international field. Because nowadays, whatever happens in America is more important to that what, than what happens to us here. Everything, in two minutes, seconds, we know everything about it. So, what happens on the international field is important. What happens on the national field is even more important. What happens in our little rich case around here is more important. And most important, what is happening inside you. There are wars being fought on all these sides. We have to fight against society. We have to fight against ourselves. We have to fight against an international uh, situation. There's all the time there is some sort of fight or war going on all the time. So. That is a very, war is, that battle is a part of our life because Hinduism actually is the only way of life which says that, in, that God is not just goodness and kindness and compassion and mercy. If that is so, where did, where did uh, badness and evil and uh, difficulties and uh, all these other things which we have, how, where did it come from? Where there's good, there's also bad. We cannot deny when there's day, there'll be light, night. We cannot deny when some be happy, we'll be unhappy also. Where did the unhappiness come from? We like only to keep one to one side, so score positive side, but and we pretend we, that um, uh, the other side doesn't exist. And this could not. The only way the other Abrahamic religions, how do they solve this particular problem? Because if God is only compassionate and loving and wonderful and great, they solved it in a very stupid way. They created a devil. They created a creature called a devil on whose head everything bad was there. Everything bad was put in the devil. If anything happens, it was the devil's fault. If anything good happens, it was God's fault. God, God's wish. <coughs> that means God is less, uh, uh, less powerful than the devil because everything God does, the devil seems to pull it down. <laughs> Isn't it? So it's a very um, amazing, it's such a stupid method of co combating this question of evil and good. Yet everybody follows it. More than half the world's population they have swallowed it. Why? Because the Bible said so. Or the, or the Quran said so. They have followed it. Hinduism is the only one who has, dis, has realized that, um, that if there is a God and if he is all powerful, then both good and evil has to come from that. There is only one source 
only one source of, of, uh, for everything, one power. And that power, both the dualities of life, has to come from only that one power. If you, if you, if you say there is another power against this, you are immediately making this God in your powerless, impotent, not omnipotent anymore. Yes, sir. So that is the most. That is why the this uh, the battlefield is is there. That here this battlefield exists. We have to accept that. We have to accept that the, everything comes uh, from one source also. So what is the way to get out of this battlefield? The only way as um, how to be victorious in the, this battlefield of life is Arjuna was uh, clever enough to take the divine himself as his own charioteer. And it's not that he's only available to Arjuna. No. Partha Sarathi is seated is in the hearts of all of us. He is there for all of us. He is the Antaryami in all of us. And as I said, we are all drops of consciousness in that ocean of uh, consciousness. And we can melt into that. But, and that power within us, we don't, we, we don't make use of. We prefer something else external to that. We'll go to a lawyer, a doctor, this and that, before we approach that inner, uh, all-powerful uh, thing, all, source of all power in ourselves. So, this is, an, again, the, the beautiful, this thing of, uh, and the symbolic, this thing of Arjuna, is, um, that is, a human being seated in the chariot of the body, having given the control of his whole chariot into the most capable hands of that divine, who is also seated, seated inside, within him. Once you give that off, then there is no more problem for you. You just have to do duty. Arjuna had to do his duty. He did not expect Krishna to choose the arrows. Huh? Arjuna had to do his duty as a Kshatriya. But he knew that the chariot was being led by the powerful hands of that divine, seated within him, and he had surrendered to that uh, divine. And therefore, despite the fact that the, uh, the, the uh, Kauravas an uh, army consisted of so many Akshohanis and these poor people had only seven Aksho Akshohanis, that means brigades. Yet, they, and also they, they had very great warriors on their side, yet the fact is that they won only because they were totally subjective, or sub so totally surrendered to that divinity within them. From the first, Arjuna said, I don't want your army, I don't want you anything, I want only you. So that surrender was there and therefore that's why he was uh, be able to. We'll just take the first chapter of the, this thing. Srimad um, <coughs> Bhagavad Gita, chapter 1 is Dharma Kshetre Kuru Kshetre Samaveda Yutsavaha Mamaka Pandavas Chaiva Kimakurvada Samyaya. Now, this um, um, Mahabharata, well, they were, oh, they, as I said, the, they had led out all the uh, armies together and they marched towards the Kurukshetra, that is the, the field of the Kurus, that is the battlefield of the Kurus. Now, ancient times, which is a dharmic war, not like now. N now, everybody, when you have a war, there's nobody spared, neither women, children, or cattle, or horses, or uh, nothing is spared. Carpet bombing is something. Look what's happening in uh, places like uh, Ukraine and all that. So, here, this was not like that. They, uh, they had a, uh, a field of battle, each uh, thing had a field of battle. So that what happened, only the Kshatriyas would go for battle. So that what happened, the culture which had been uh, the, so for so many years was not destroyed. The agriculture could keep on doing, farming could do it. The women and children were, were, uh, were protected. The, the economy, this thing, the, the, everything went on as usual. Only the Kshatriyas would fight the war with it. So nowadays, th there is no victor for a war. Because everything is totally demolished, totally de de devastated. That was not like that. So it's actually the Dharma Yuddha. It was a Dharma Yuddha. So Dharma Kshetre Kurukshetre. Now, there are two amazing words. So they, had, they went to the... Sorry, let's go on to that. <coughs> they went to the, uh, the this thing and... Uh, that uh, Kurukshetra is still, if you go to, it's very close to, quite close to uh, Delhi. And uh, there, there, they lined up, uh, each army facing against each other. And uh, it, is, uh, it was uh, beaut beautifully laid out. And everyone was excited. You know how one has to give excitement to the soldiers. Otherwise, they won't fight. 
you have to make them you know very strong and try to you know um, be ready for battle so they were, they were all the singing you know? at that time <coughs> this whole th war the chapter 1 who was saying this chapter 1 the the rashtra the blind king is the first person character that we meet here now he cannot fight so how what is he doing so the fact is he was in his um, in his uh, palace and he was feeling very upset he knew that this was a very adharmic thing he knew that basically but he was very feeling rather upset now at that time vyasa comes to him and uh, he says all right what do you want so the um, rashtra says i want to see the battle i can't go i can i want to see so he says, all right, I'll give the Jnana uh, Chakshu. That means the, the eye of knowledge I'll give to Sanjaya. Sanjaya is his uh, prime minister, his personal prime minister, who, could, uh, who was doing everything for him because he was blind. So he said, I'll give it to Sanjaya because Sanjaya is a very highly dharmic person. He wouldn't give it to the Rashtra himself because he was totally a dharmic. So he, I'll give it to uh, Sanjaya, he says. So Sanjaya actually at that time it is said, uh, Sanjaya goes to the, uh, the battlefield because he was one of those. Then after the fall of Bhishma only, he comes up. On the tenth day, he comes back. At that time only, he, he tells the whole uh, story of the, of the Gita to him. So, and that, uh, Sanjaya is supposed to be given that divine vision by which he could see everything like a modern, you know, uh, TV commentator or something, football commentator or something like that. He could see everything. Not only he could see, he could look into the hearts of the people who were there also. So he gave a brilliant commentary to the Rashtra who was sitting in the palace. So his first, and I said, the first thing is his Dharmakshetra, Kurukshetra. Now these are two opposites. In ancient texts always, you know, something which makes you suddenly, how can Dharmakshetra and Kurukshetra become Dharmakshetra? The first thing we'll think. Because Kurukshetra is a battlefield. Dharmakshetra is a field of righteousness. How can they come? Battle is the most unrighteous thing. So that has, we have to be, that's why I've already said, told you, even though life is a, we find life, there is always, um, um, there is problem and uh, um, troubles and, um, you know, so, uh, so much happening. At the same time, there is also a revival and creation and, uh, flowering of things going on at the same time. Here on one side, both Vishnu and Shiva all the time working. On one side, there is constant revival, creation, uprising, so on. On the other side, there is constant decay, death uh, and degradation. So these two are always in conjunction with each other. So, Dharmakshetra and Kurukshetra. So even though uh, Kurukshetra is a battlefield, yet the fact is that is also Dharmakshetra. Because in that very battlefield itself, which was also, also uh, available. And therefore, you will find that despite all this, there is also progress, there is harmony, there is love, there is beatitude, there is beauty, everything is there. So, Kurukshetra can and can be made into a Dharmakshetra if we have the mind to do so. Now again, another amazing thing, you can, if you want to know what is the, uh, the, the meaning of the... Um, Bhagavad Gita, in a nutshell, what is the first word of the uh, Bhagavad Gita? Is dharma. Dharma means righteousness. Righteousness, duty, everything. So many things. Dharma is a word which has a lot of connotations. It means my duty, so dharma is my duty, uh, my, the, the righteousness, the consciousness. And what is the last word of the Bhagavad Gita? Yatra Yogeshwara Krishna, Yatra Parto, Danudhara, Tatra Shiva, Jiva, Bhudir, Bhudir, Mama. So he says, uh, what is the, this thing? Mama is the last one, see? Yatra Yogeshwara Krishna, Yatra Parto, Danudhara, Tatra Shiva, Jiva, Bhudir, Dhruva, Nidhar, Madhir, Mama. So last word is Mama. So what is the, uh, the, the, um, the uh, uh, whole subject matter of the Bhagavad Gita? Mama Dharma. What is my dharma? Everybody is asking, what is my dharma? What should I do? How should I behave? What are the things? Mama dharma. It teaches you that to sing of mama dharma. So that's the first chapter. We will just set here the first uh, thing here. Dharma kshetre kurukshetre samaveda yutsavaha mamaka pandava saiva kimakkurvada sanyaya. So this uh, Rasha said, O oh, sanya, gathered on this holy field of the kurush. 
What are they doing? My sons and the sons of Pandu. Immediately he puts a division between his sons and the sons of Pandu. Actually they should also be like his own son, his brother's sons. Brother has died. Yet he makes, he makes that this thing from the beginning. See, this whole thing is described. He says, uh, now the, you know, how these people are coming, the Kauravas are here and the Pandavas are there. And uh, you see, Atta Shura, Maheshwaza, he gives a list of all the people, great warriors on the Kaurava side and the great warriors on the Pandava side. And he gives all the list of the, all of them. Then he says, uh, So he says, uh, ah, At that time, now this is very, before the start of a war, they have already chosen the generals. The general of the, the Bhishma was the general of the Kaurava army. He was a Pitamaha, the grandsire. So, whereas the Pandava army chose uh, Dhrishtadyumna, actually they chose one other before he, he fell the first stage, sir. So, we'll say actually for all purposes, Dhrishtadyumna, the, the brother of um, Draupadi, was the general of the Pandava army. So, before the start, uh, Bhishma comes to the middle of the, this thing and he's, he's, he's in the formation. And they have formations, by the way, different formations. For instance, if their Suji formation is a needle formation, then immediately the other party will make an eagle formation because then Suji can, uh, they can pierce through that. And these eagles will try and come round on them. So every, they have certain formations. For these, there are, uh, um, so now he, they had, uh, in the, Bhishma was in the, uh, in the front of that formation and he blew his conch. Then, that was a signal. Every other person, Banjajanyam, Hrishikesham, Devadattam, Dananya, Baundram, Dattam, Mahashangam, Vigodara. Baundram, Dattam, Mahashangam, Bhima, Karma, Vigodara. Vijaya, Raja, Kunti, Putra, Yudhishthira, Nagula, Sahare, Davat, Sugosha, Manipushvaka. All the names, the great uh, weapons and uh, conks of the great warriors had names. Then in the uh, Krishna's uh, conch was known as Banjajanya. And uh, so all of them had... Uh, Devadatta was the name of Arjuna's conch. And the name of his bow, as you know, is Gandivam. It was very famous. He was a very famous, most, um, the greatest archer in the whole of Bharat at that time. So each of them blew the conch. At that time, what does he say? Uh, other, um, yeah. So he says, Tatra Bashan, Vishwa Dura, Eva Toshi Kesha, Gurahi Barada, Sena Yoru, Vyor Madhya, Stabi Tuamar. So, what does he, Raj, Arjuna tells Vishma, I mean Krishna? He says, Look, I want to see, I want to see the formation there. There, 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 there is a huge gap between the two armies. So he says, Please keep the my chariot in the middle. Because closer to the pan, in the in the Duryodhana's army, so I can see the formation there. So he now Krishna takes uh, this thing and um, places it. He does not place the, this is a very important point which many people mistake it. Bhishma Savreda Vaja Partha Pashedan Savavedan Kuru Nidhi. Instead of placing it in front of um, uh, Duryodhana and the other people and uh, other Kurus. Krishna very cleverly, cleverly meaning it was an, in, in a way that it instigates Arjuna's feelings because if that had not been instigated, there would have been no cause for the, uh, the Bhagavad Gita discourse. Because Arjuna, had, till then he was very ready. He was quite uh, prepared. He knew whom he has to fight. After all, he knows very well whom he has to fight. And he had prepared himself all, you know, hacked up, ready to fight this war against all these people. But, and had he placed him before the Duryodhana and others, nothing would, Arjuna would still be very, you know, feeling angry and desiring to fall. Instead, Krishna very cleverly places him before Bhishma Drona Pramukhata Sarvesha Mahikshita. So he places them before Bhishma. And Arjuna looks at them, looks at Bhishma. And what does he see? He doesn't see this warrior, but he sees that grandfather who he never had a father. The only father he knew was Bhishma. He had dandled him on his legs and lap and you know, played with him and given him all instructions. Drona, then he looked at Drona and who he, everything he knew today. If he was Arjuna today, it was because of Drona who taught him everything. Krupa, all of them. 
They loved him more than their own son. Drona loved him more than their, his own son. So he looked at them as this great warrior who had, had, was, a, was a hero of so many battles. It is said that he totally lost his nerve. His hand quivered. And Gandhi vam samsade hastat. Tvatcheva parivdushyade. And his tongue set to cleave, cle, cleave into his mouth, he said. Hmm? Arjuna overcome and spoke in sorrow. Hmm? Dhrishtvayvam svajanam krishna yuritsam samuvasthitam sidanti mamagatrani mugam chapparishushyade. Vebhagascha sharire me romashrasya jayade. Gandhi vam samsade hastat. Tvatcheva paridahyade. Nacha shaknu abhyavsadum. Pramadeva che mana. My whole mind is reeling. My Gandhi Mama, which he'll never put down even for a minute, fell with a thud to the this thing. He himself sank to the cell. I cannot fight. This is the beginning of the Bhagavad Gita, which a very wonderful scene. He said, drama is about curtain, is about to rise on the battle. And the main character says, I can't go to the stage, I can't go to the stage. Imagine what the poor director has to do. <laughs> the Arjuna is like that. So frightened, he says, I won't go to the stage. So he, that is the beginning. And he, from then onwards, he will, before that, then onwards he won't start. In fact, he will allow Arjuna to say everything he wants. Because he knows Arjuna is going through a terrible time, become weak with sorrow, with compassion actually. Because these, mine, my children, my nephews, my niece, my grandfather, when that my comes in, you lose all discrimination after that. So that was a state which Arjuna was in. And to him, uh, he allows him to speak to his oldest thing before he starts off on the second. Hmm? In fact, he gives a very good, Arjuna gives a very good this thing, how we should not fight. That a battle is very bad, we will, everything will be lost and perished. So he gives all this, but um, and, um, Krishna listens to everything without saying a word. Only then he starts to discourse from chapter 2. Okay. Om Sarvesham Swastir Bhavatu Sarvesham Shantir Bhavatu Sarvesham Purnam Bhavatu Sarvesham Mangalam Bhavatu Sarve Bhavantu Sukhina Sarve Santu Niramaya Sarve Bhadrani Vashyantu Ma Kaschit Dukha Bhavave Om Shanti Shanti